everybody. Uh, my name is JJ Gladden. I work with Arkansas Game and Fish Commission in the Education Division, and this is our now we're on the second Tuesday, so our uh, our monthly seminar that we do online. And this week we will be talking, or this month, I guess, is the the correct term. This month is all about farm pond management, and we've got a panel here that. Uh, Hopefully, for y'all's sake, are a lot smarter about this than I am. So that's why I brought them in. And we'll give it a few more minutes, make sure everybody has joined us, and we will start our introductions and get into it. A little bit of housekeeping uh, for people that are new to Zoom. We're going to stay muted. Um, that way, your screen doesn't jump around from person to person, and everybody can get all the information that that they need and they're expecting out of this. We will take questions at the end and we'll be doing the questions via the chat feature. That way, uh, that way we can have a record of the questions and uh, keep track of them, nothing gets lost, things like that. So, I don't see anybody else in the waiting room, so we are going to get started. Um, I will start with uh, introducing Brett Timmon. Brett, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. Uh, my name is Brett Timmons. I'm Northeast Arkansas Fisheries Biologist or District Biologist for the state. Um, and we'll go into that a little more during my presentation. but. Uh, I cover 10 counties in Northeast Arkansas. Um, so if you have pond issues, you're probably in Northeast Arkansas, you're gonna be talking to me, most likely. Okay, thank you, Brett. Uh, next is Justin Homan, and I'll let him do all his stuff. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like JJ said, my name is Justin Homan. I'm the uh, District 4 Fisheries Supervisor Based out of Brinkley, I also cover 10 counties, uh, pretty much east central Arkansas from Pulaski County, the Mississippi River. Uh, got a bachelor from Virginia Tech and a master's from Arkansas Tech. Worked in North Carolina for about eight years and I've been in eastern Arkansas for about eight years. So uh, had a lot of pond calls past 15 years or so and Look forward to helping you all out with your ponds tonight. Perfect. Thank you, Justin. Next, we have Scott Jones from UAPB. <clears throat> Greetings. I'm the Small Impoundments Extension Specialist for the state. I have a statewide jurisdiction. I primarily help extension agents with their pond calls in their counties. But in cases where complex issues or more sampling is needed. I'll make site visits throughout the state and just kind of schedule things as we can. Perfect, thank you. And last but not least from the Big Easy, we have George Selden. Uh, I just, I'm George Selden. I've been uh, an aquaculture specialist for UAPV since, for, since 2001. Since 2006, uh, a big portion of my program has been aquatic vegetation control and I'm actually in New Orleans at a meeting for aquatic plant management so I guess it's timely that uh, this is taking place today. Awesome thank you for uh, for joining us uh, remotely I, you know I guess that's why this zoom thing works out well for us uh, we started doing it during COVID and it's something that we think is good enough that uh, it can stick so we're, we're going to keep rolling with it. Like I said, my name is JJ Gladden. Uh, I work for Arkansas Game and Fish in the Education Division. And basically what falls under my umbrella is uh, educating about fish, fishing, anything that lives in the water. Uh, some things I know better than others, but um, that's that's kind of how we got on this, this uh, little segment here is we wanted to find a way to still be able to, to teach things about fish and fishing in a remote world. So we started this series and this is what's come out of it. So thank you all for being here tonight. 
And we're going to kick things off with uh, Brett. He's got a little PowerPoint for us. Going here. Let me know if he, that pulls up. I can see it, Brett. It looks good. Greetings. Uh, my name is Brett Timmons. I am the Northeast Arkansas District Biologist. Uh, I'm located in Jonesboro, Arkansas. So those of you turning in from uh, NEA, I will most likely be your contact on pond issues um, if you have those in one of my 10 counties. Uh, tonight I'll be covering kind of a wide range of topics uh, from pond construction, to uh, common pond questions, to private pond rules and regulations. So uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I've got a master's in fishery science from the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. I've got a bachelor's of science in zoology from Southern Illinois University. And I have a, approximately 15 years of experience in the fisheries industry. Um, I've worn many hats over that time, and from being a private pond consultant to a research assistant for a university to a fish farmer, and lastly, a state fisheries biologist. And I've also had the uh, uh, luck of owning a private pond for over 30 plus years. So I have quite a bit of experience dealing with private ponds or small impoundment management. <clears throat> First, I'm going to go into a little bit of, of discussion about pond construction. It's going to be very uh, minimal. Uh, we'll try to work through a lot of topics here, so they're going to be a brief. If you have questions, feel free to hit the chat, and we can follow up either in email or in chat later. So the, oh, the biggest thing um, that you want to look at for when you're looking at designing um, or planning to build a pond is your overall goal of your pond what that pond is going to be for. Is it going to be purely aesthetic where you can sit out on your back porch and drink your coffee and look at it every morning? Or is it going to be a, a trophy largemouth bass fishery or a trophy brim fishery or a cat fishery? Um, that's something that's important and something you should actually look at at defining before you even think about building a pond. Um, next would be where to build. Um, you need to look at your topography of your land, um, what would be suited for building a pond um, and a particular type of pond, which we'll kind of go into later. Um, but you need to be aware of what would be advantageous on your property to have a pond in a location. Um, you need to be cognizant of your water sources. Are you looking at whether or not this pond is just going to be filled by rainfall? Or are you gonna use groundwater source or a surface water source to actually fill that pond? A pond is gonna need water throughout the year, especially in the, the hot summer months in Arkansas when you do see some evaporation. So you need to think about um, this very carefully and, and design your pond and plan to build it in a place that it is gonna be able to refill itself uh, periodically throughout the year. Um, especially in these drought years, um, that could be a major issue. Uh, hey, next Brett, would be line um, of sight. Uh, hey, hey, Brett, yeah. you, your slides aren't advancing. Okay. If you want to unshare, I can I can do yours or uh, okay. you may be Let sharing me, the wrong one. I just stopped sharing. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know why it's not advancing. It is here. So... If you want me to share it for you, I can. Yeah, go ahead, JJ. Got if it's you. not doing it, I don't understand why. Got gotcha, you, buddy. It's working on this end. So that'll work right there. I'll go back. So the first topic I'm going to talk about again is pond construction. Um, like I said, your overall goal is your most important thing. Um, next, you want to look at where to build and your topography of your land. 
Um, and then, of course, the water sources and how to get that filled um, every year or in dry drought years um, throughout it. Um, next would be line of sight. This is if it's going to be a pond that is is going to be fishable, is going to be used as, as purely aesthetic, you're going to want to have a, to keep an eye on it. Um, you're not going to want to have a pond necessarily on the back of your property if you're using it as a fishing pond where you're not going to see it every day and not be able to see what's happening with the pond, whether or not you have fish kills, whether or not you have algae growing in it, you don't want to be surprised. So having a line of sight of your pond um, is a very important step. Um, lastly is soil type. One of the most important steps in the process of planning and designing a pond is soil type. It's often overlooked by pond owners um, because soil type and fertility of the soil is highly important. Um, after all, you want one, you want your, your pond to hold water and you want it to be as productive as possible in the first couple of years of its life. Um, so you need to look at doing soil samples <laughs> Um, either through uh, NRCS and sending those in or through an extension agent um, to look at whether you have enough clay to build a pond, whether you have enough fertility, and whether you need to add amendments to the soil um, because it's a lot easier to amend those soils while the pond is being built or empty rather than full of water. You can advance, JJ's please. So there are four basic types of ponds. Um, first being excavated, which is a pond that is basically you're digging a hole in the ground. Um, you're either using the, the spent soil as levees or you're just dissipating it out into the natural landscape or moving it off someplace else. Um, the second would be an embankment pond, which is basically uh, a reservoir where you're may only have a levee on one end of it and you're in a valley so you're building an embankment between two peaks. Um, the next would be a combination of an excavated embankment or even a levee pond and the last type of pond would be an actual levee pond um, where you're bringing in dirt or excavating some dirt and building up levees around that pond uh, to create that pond. Um, one thing we always want to stress when we're getting new pond owners to think about building a pond is you always want to build to that three to one slope. Um, that's a safety issue for people accessing your pond and people fishing from the bank. If they were to slip in, that allows them to easily get out of the pond versus a pond with a sharper slope or a, a straight drop off. Advance, JJ, please. All right, the next important step is your pond should complement your surroundings, meaning that if you have a, a, an area that has some vegetation, has some trees, you can actually form that pond to fit that surrounding, fit that area and look more natural within there. Um, there are a number of, of shapes here off to the side that your pond could be. And that is a highly important to create um, complexity of shoreline, which ultimately increases habitat diversity. Um, and it will ultimately increase fish diversity in there. It gives lots of area for different types of fishes to live as habit in their habitat. Um, and by creating shoreline diversity, you know, you can use things like peninsulas, inlets, islands, humps in there. Um, things like that to create it. Creating a free form design in your pond is much better than just creating a bowl. Uh, creating a round eclipse or an oval um, doesn't have a whole lot of shoreline diversity. Uh, the next thing you want to look at is the complexity of the underwater features. That also increases diversity of a habitat for different types of fishes and by creating humps, ledges, creek channels in your pond, you're ultimately going to help the fish populations by creating a diverse habitat um, in that pond and allow those fishes to get the best advantage of the structures within that pond. Go ahead and advance, JJ. 
the last thing I would stress is habitat, habitat, and more habitat. The more habitat you can put in the pond, whether you're actually using woody debris or you're creating artificial habitat by some of these pictures here, using pallets or concrete blocks, the better off you'll be for your fish populations. One of the biggest mistakes I see pond owners doing is they go into a plot of land where they're gonna build a pond, they clear all the trees out and then they burn them. They need to be using that woody debris in their pond to create habitat for those fish. So don't think about getting rid of those trees, think about utilizing those trees in your pond as habitat. And the easiest time to do that is when your pond is being built and when it's empty versus when it already is filled with water. You can advance, JJ. The next topic I'm gonna to brush on is common pond questions. These are just common questions that come through my office on a daily or a weekly basis. So JJ, can you advance please? Um, one of the biggest questions I get is what do I do? And this has to deal with management. It can deal with a multiple areas of management in a pond. Um, but I get a, these are just random questions that I've gotten in the past couple weeks. You know, my pond turned over, most or all my fish are dead, what do I do? All my fish are at the surface and seem to be dying, what do I do? I noticed dead fish in my pond and suspect my pond was poisoned, what do I do? First of all, I'll take the last question first, basically. If no frogs, turtles, snakes are dead, it's probably not a poisoning. Generally, if it, your pond is poisoned, um, you will actually see terrestrial and aquatic species dead in the area. So frogs are a big indicator. If you're seeing frogs and turtles and snakes and things that actually will breathe air and they're dead along with your fish, you probably got an issue. Otherwise, it's probably not a poisoning. Um, there are a multitude of reasons why a pond can turn over far more than we can actually go into here tonight, but most fish kills are a direct result of a lack of oxygen in the water. And that can happen multiple ways. It could be the location of your pond. It could be the size of your pond. It could be the depth of your pond. It could be fertilization and your pond reaches carrying capacity. Um, it's really a complex question um, and we'll need to have a lot more investigation to really look into why you may have an issue with your pond or why your pond may have turned over. And it will lead us to asking a lot more questions to try to get at uh, the forensics of why your pond actually turned over or why you had a fish kill. Go ahead and advance. The next um, greatest question or most asked question we get is what's in my pond? Um, I just bought a new pond or new property and I wanna know what's in my pond. I haven't been catching any fish in my pond, so what's in my pond? Uh, or I'm only catching small brim or largemouth bass or crappie in a pond. Again, these are very complex questions and will, will require us to do a lot more in-depth investigation. So you may get questions from us like how big is your pond? How often do you fish your pond? When's the last time you fished your pond? What'd you fish for? What baits were you using? Are you catching any fish? If you're catching fish, what species are they and what size are they? These will all lead us to figuring out what's wrong with your pond. So these are things you need to kind of be prepared for when you start bringing this up. Again, we can look at and people and consultants can look at assessing a pond, but these are things that really need to be brought up in the forefront when you first start asking these questions so we can get out the forensics of why you're seeing those issues with in that pond that you're seeing. So, and again, I realize this is really a, a brief discussion on this, but that's something we can follow up with later um, once we kind of get some more information about your pond. So you can go ahead and advance. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about some private pond rules and regulations or misnomers uh, that come misinformation out of the coffee shop. So the first misnomer is 
a fishing license is required to fish anywhere in Arkansas, which includes your private pond. Um, do you have a link here for an advance, JJ, sorry. Uh, there's a link here for um, AGFC app that you can actually go on and do online licensing nowadays, but it's just like private um, woods or a private hunting area. You have to have a license to actually hunt for deer or turkey um, on that private land. You're, you're not excused from uh, ha having a license to actually fish your private pond. Vance, JJ, please. Um, next, I want to talk about some live fish trade and bait fish regulations that for, for some people aren't aware that just were passed this January 1st, uh, 2021. Um, this new bait trade and uh, bait fish regulation prohibits the release of wild caught fish, either native or non-native. So how does this affect a pond owner? Well, basically you cannot release fish out of your pond into any public waterway. Um, so we get a lot of questions about people wanting my bass. My pond is overpopulated with largemouth bass. Can I stock them in one of your lakes? Because when I fish your lakes, I don't catch any largemouth bass. And the answer to that is no, you cannot stock any of our, any public waterways. Um, the next thing that this bait fish regulation basically pro prohibits is uh, the use of bait fish um, outside of the same water body where they were caught. So you cannot take bait fish out of your pond and go fish in the St. Francis River, for example, or the Arkansas River. You can only catch bait fish in the same body of water where you are fishing. Um, and we get a lot of questions nowadays about this and people wanting to take this. This excludes cut bait, so you can take dead fish to another water body. You just cannot take wild caught bait fish and use them out of your pond into another pond. Um, and I kind of touched on this subject a minute ago. Um, it prohibits stocking of public waters, except in AGFC coordinated projects. Um, so you cannot take fish out of your pond and stock any other public waters uh, in the state. And a public water uh, could be a pond that's owned by multiple people as well. Um, that is considered waters of the state. So moving fish from one uh, pond to another is prohibited. Um, next. Uh, continue on that. It only allows for stocking of approved farm reared species and there's approximately 80 fish species that are approved um, in aquaculture for stocking into private ponds and this is the code here that it, it is listed under. So you can look it up on our Game and Fish website and next it, it states that you can only stock triploid grass carp. This is something new um, to Arkansas. Arkansas has been a major pusher on this its aspect. Um, so you need to be aware that if you go to stock grass carp in your private pond that they need to be triploid and that's something you need to be asking the fish farmer about if you go to stock that. Go ahead and advance JJ. Lastly um, we have a new state regulation that was passed this year which is it's our pull the plug campaign which it means you must remove all plugs before leaving a loading area. So you're asking, what does this have to do with my private pond? If you've got a boat and you've got a pond that's big enough to put a boat in it, if you put that boat in your pond and fish it and then pull it out and want to move it someplace else, you need to pull the plug on it, which includes live wells, boat plugs, village plugs. Um, this just stops the movement of aquatic hitchhikers um, like zebra mussels and other things, which also could include aquatic vegetation. Um, being hitchhiking on your boat or in your equipment into another public waterway. So with that, JJ, you can advance. With that, um, that's going to be the end of my presentation. This is my contact information that will go out to everybody. Um, and again, I'm the District 3 or Northeast Arkansas Fisheries 
biologist. Um, and this is my email and my phone number if you'd like to contact me. With that, I will uh, uh, pass it over to Justin, I believe. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I'm going to share Justin's slides and let him get going. All right. Thanks, JJ. Uh, I already kind of covered, you know, my area of responsibility and background. My topic is specifically, you know, what does Game and Fish provide as far as pond management assistance to pond owners? Uh, go ahead, next slide. So my, my picture on this first slide is actually the, the Farm Pond Management for Recreational Fishing Guide. Uh, we call it Farm Pond Guide, the Pond Guide MP360. It's uh, a publication by UAPB and Arkansas Game and Fish and uh, it, it's a pond management guide for recreational fishing. And that's, that's what Game and Fish provides assistance with is helping folks manage their pond for fishing. And uh, so the topics I'm gonna cover real briefly, uh, and this is kind of an outline of, of the pond management guide itself is design and construction, pond environment, the fish species in the pond, fish ma managing those uh, fish in the pond and some, a few other pond problems that we, we run across. Uh, next slide. So as far as design and construction, uh, Brett talked about it a little bit. Uh, you know, as far as like the dirt, what is it going to make? Is the soil going to hold water? Uh, you know, is the dam in good shape? Have you got a good drawdown structure? All that stuff. Uh, you know, Brett had that publication by the Department of Agriculture. We normally refer folks to the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. There's a, a office in every county in the state. And as far as specific plans on designing the pond, is it gonna hold water? We usually refer folks to the NRCS. Uh, Brett really talked about the habitat. Uh, we, that, that's where we come in as far as pond, you know, designing a pond. Is it, you know, the amount of shoreline can really affect how productive your pond is. Adding in fish attractors can really help. Uh, if you just build a big square pond with not much shoreline, with nothing out there, those fish are constantly going to be swimming around. Ambush predators like bass, they like to have somewhere to sit, and it makes them easier to catch when they're in one spot. If you know where those spots are, it, it, it's great. It helps increase your uh, fishing experience and increase your, your luck when you're fishing. Uh, and then, you know, something else to think about is spawning habitat. Pea gravel makes really good spawning habitat. You really like to brim fish. Putting out some pea gravel before you, you uh, flood your pond helps you uh, give a place to target those fish, uh, and it will also increase productivity of your pond. Next slide. Uh, next thing is, is managing the pond environment. And this, this picture comes from the pond management guide, but, uh, you know, every pond is kind of like its own unique ecosystem, and it supports itself. You have uh, planktonic algae that naturally occurs or zooplankton that eat the, uh, the algae and then small fish eat, eat the zooplankton and your big fish eat the small fish. Uh, some of the things you might want to consider and that we can help you with is, is uh, soil samples, water samples. Brett talked about doing soil samples before you flood your pond. Water samples can really help you look at your, your alkalinity of your pond Soil samples are uh, done. We, we can get you in touch with your local extension agent who, with the University of Arkansas. They analyze water samples. They analyze soil samples. Water samples can, you know, look, have you got soft water, um, low alkalinity? Uh, certain parts of the state, like the Washita Mountains, Boston Mountains, Arkansas River Valley in my district, Western Pulaski County, especially has really soft water. Uh, sometimes you can have pretty bad pH fluctuations. So figuring that out really helps. The soil sample will help you know exactly how much lime you need to add to your pond to correct pH problems. And if you do decide to uh, fertilize to make your fertilization more productive. 
fertilizing and feeding fish are, are things you can do to make your pond more productive if you want to go that extra step. Uh, there, they do need to uh, be continued once you start, but you know those are things we can help make those decisions for you as you're trying to figure out how to manage your pond. Next slide. Uh, fish species. I've got a picture of our fort, sport fish suppliers list on here. That's a lot of the questions that we handle. Uh, what do you stock? What, what do I need to stock? How many do I need to stock? When do I stock them? Where do I get fish from? We have a sport fish suppliers list of hatcheries all over the state that have fish that you can purchase your fish from. We could help you on what fish you need to stock, how many to stock, uh, when to stock them. You don't want to stock your predators and your prey fish all at the same time. Sometimes you want to separate those out a little bit. And there's also some fish that you don't want to put in your pond, and we can help you uh, figure out which ones you want to avoid. And, and I know Scott's going to talk about that some too. Next slide. So uh, fish management, once you have fish in the pond or you have a pond, a new, new piece of property, well, what's in my pond? Uh, Brett talked about that. Uh, well, there's two things we, we normally recommend, either a catch record, which is a really detailed uh, chart that the pond owner fills out as they fish, record what species you're catching, what sizes you're catching, how long you fish for it. Uh, once you fill out that information and fish pond for three to six months, most of the time we can make a good recommendation on how to manage your pond for your goals. Uh, sanding is another option. Uh, you can purchase a 50 foot sane and sane the pond and uh, determine your fish balance that way, your population balance. A lot of times you're, you're either gonna have a bluegill crowded situation where you've got a bunch of small brim and only a couple large bass, or you might be largemouth bass crowded where you have a lot of small skinny bass and a bunch of, or in, in most of your brim are pretty large in size. And then sometimes you might have a balanced pond where you're catching a, a lot of fish of different sizes of all the species. So uh, we can help you figure out where you're at and uh, we'll make recommendations to get to your goals. Next slide. Uh, so this is kind of talks about what we do to get to those goals that I was, I was mentioning. Uh, most of the time off a catch record or, or saning, uh, Saning, saning records, we can, we can make, we can figure out where you're at and make recommendations. Sometimes it's, it's a little bit more difficult, and and we do come out and do site visits after we have a catch record. Uh, there's a pond consultation <laughs> application for a game and fish biologists to come out and take a look at your pond. Uh, we do some, some of our districts. I'm not 100% sure if all of our districts have an electrofishing boat that can come out and shock your pond and evaluate it that way. We do do that in, in some circumstances. Uh, we can look at that, figure out what's going on if, if the catch record in the app doesn't work. And we make harvest recommendations, uh, corrective stockings might be needed. Uh, sometimes drawdowns help. If you can lower the water level of your pond, especially when you've got uh, uh, too many prey, a drawdown will help increase your uh, uh, predation on those prey and help get your pond back in balance. And sometimes we recommend a complete renovation. It just depends on uh, the situation. Next slide. Other problems we deal with, and George is really our, our, our expert in the state for uh, aquatic vegetation, but you know, a lot of times pond owners call game, or the game of fish biologists, hey, I've got this vegetation in my pond. Well, with smartphones nowadays, if you can get some good detailed pictures, this one, uh, in the slide is a picture from a pond owner of some vegetation they had that they sent me. Uh, usually we can get an ID on it and, and help you uh, figure out a plan of attack. And, you know, if it's, if we're stumped on it or need some help, we, George will give us some help too. Uh, dissolved oxygen issues, we can help you manage some of that, which usually leads to fish kills. And if you have fish kills, we can help you recover from those either by making stocking recommendations or, uh, uh, you know, just, waiting it out and letting those fish recover after doing a catch record. Muddy water, that's something else we, uh, we deal with quite a bit and, uh, you know, we'll, we can help folks out with. Next slide. Uh, just final thoughts on this slide. 
Game of fish, our expertise lies in fish and managing fish pop, the fish populations in your pond for, for successful fishing trips. Um, every pond is different, and Brett really touched on this, and, and it's really important is you really need to know what you want out of the pond. Sometimes there's ponds with multiple landowners. One guy might want to manage for crappie. One guy might want to man manage for trophy bass. Uh, sometimes you can't do everything with one pond. So it's really good. You need to have a good goal in mind of what you want. And typically we can manage, help you manage for that goal. As long as it's, it's, you know, the majority of the people that are managing the pond are in favor of that. And really, you know, Ponds are some of the best places for successful fishing opportunities. There's a picture of my little girl from several years ago where, you know, one of, that's where I took her to introduce her to fishing. You know, ponds are, are really good opportunities for kids to catch fish. That's all I've got for my presentation. Very good. Very good. Thank you, sir. Next up, we've got Scott Jones from UAPB. And Scott, were you handling yours or am I doing it? Yep, make sure that it is uh, advancing slides properly. Uh, you got it. All right. Did we go to the fish picture? We're doing it. You got All it, right. man. Get after it. Good deal. So, got a lot to cover, not much time to do it. So, we're going to hit it hot and heavy. Going into species selection, we're going to talk about what species tend to work in Arkansas and a little bit about stocking rates. So in very quick generalizations, we're gonna talk about three categories of fish, forage fish, sport fish, and vegetation control fish. In general, for your forage fish, they need to be relatively small, six to eight inches in length or, smallest, or smaller when they are mature. That way they don't get too big for your sport fish to eat. They also need to feed low on the food chain. That means they eat insects, they eat insect larvae, or they eat plankton. You don't want your forage fish competing directly with your sport fish for food. There's only so much, uh, so many pounds of fish a pond can grow. And if it's all bound up in uh, forage fish, then uh, your sport fish won't grow as well. Your sport fish just need to provide the type of fishing uh, experience that you want. Do you want to use a float and a worm and catch a, a fish on every cast? Really good for kids, really good for folks learning how to fish. Or do you want to grow the biggest bass you've ever caught? Different stocking strategies for different goals of your pond. You also want to have consistent reproduction in your sport fish or understand that you'll need to restock those fish on a regular basis to make sure that they stay uh, populated enough for your satisfaction. And another important thing to remember about sport fish, harvest is very important. Uh, otherwise, they don't grow as fast. They don't grit, get as large. You need to harvest your sport fish properly. And then biological control fish. This is for vegetation control. There are a few species that are uh, allowed in Arkansas. We'll talk a little bit about each one. You want to make sure that you identify the species of plant growing in your pond first because not all vegetation control fish eat everything. Grass carp is a really commonly recommended one but they do not eat everything. So make sure you ID those plants before you consider stocking fish. And you also wanna make sure that your vegetation control fish do not interfere with the goals of your pond. Example, if you are trying to grow trophy bluegills, do not put tilapia in your pond because they compete directly with your bluegills for habitat and food. And then in general, for all fish, they need to be compatible with your climate. Uh, for Northern Arkansas is slightly different than Southern Arkansas. They have to be compatible with the regulations. They have to be health certified and uh, approved from <clears throat> approved fish farms. And the habitat has to be compatible. Is your pond uh, really clear and deep or is it shallow and muddy? Not all species do well in those situations. So in the first category, talking about forage fish, fathead minnows and golden shiner are co commonly recommended together for brand new ponds or ponds that have been renovated. The fathead is a fairly small minnow, two to three inches max. It is a, a good forage fish for young bass, uh, making the transition from eating zooplankton to small fish uh, and on the way to eating bluegills. They're a good starter fish, uh, but they don't tend to last very long in ponds. They get eaten out really quickly. Golden shiner are slightly larger. They can get six to eight inches in length, so they can be a nice next step from your fatheads to your golden shiners uh, to your bluegills. Uh, they are a good supplemental stocking uh, forage fish. You will get short-term boost in your bass growth and condition, 
uh, from stocking golden shiners and fathead minnows, but light fatheads, they don't tend to persist very long because they just get eaten so readily. You can get habitat uh, in the pond in the form of really tight, dense cover in a way that you can keep fatheads and golden shiners consistent or persistent in the pond for several years. But in most cases, they get wiped out within a year or so, and you just need to restock them each year to maintain the benefit. Uh, goldfish kind of goes along this uh, line too. They are a, they're a perfectly fine forage fish, but they don't reproduce enough to keep their numbers up and they're slow, they're dumpy, they're, they're dumb, they get eaten really quickly. So they don't persist long in ponds either. Now tilapia, they very well can persist in the pond all year. They are very prolific. They will compete with your bluegills for habitat and food. And also they don't survive winters, especially in Northern Arkansas. When tilapia, uh, when the water gets into the mid fifties, tilapia gets sluggish. When it gets into the low fifties, they start to die. So in most ponds in Arkansas, if you want tilapia as a supplemental forage fish, expect that you'll need to restock them each year to maintain their benefit. Now the shads, there are two main shads, the threadfin shad and the gizzard shad. Typically for ponds, threadfin shad are the superior choice because they get to about six or so inches in length and they don't get too large. They are prolific enough that they can maintain their population assuming they survive the winter. They are cold sensitive as well. They can survive a little bit cooler water than the tilapia can, but in the upper 40s, they start struggling. In the low 40s, they might start to die. Now, if it's a nice gradual decline in temperature, they might be able to handle it. But if it's a really quick cold snap from uh, 55 to 45 in a week or so, your thread fin are gone, you'll need to restock them. We saw that a lot this year. Uh, gizzard shad, they are a really large forage fish. They can get up to 12 inches in length. They are a good forage fish for trophy bass ponds, and that's about it. The only time I'll recommend gizzard shads is if an owner already has mm three, four, five pound bass in the pond and they're ready to make the step from really good bass pond to ridiculously good bass pond, but only if they've got bass, big bass in there already. Now the bluegills and the red ear, they fill kind of a gray area between forage fish and sport fish. Depending on your goals, they might be a primary forage fish or they might be your primary sport fish. For example, in a bass pond, your bluegill are gonna be the, the primary forage fish for most sizes of your bass. But if you want to grow really big bluegills, they might be the main sport fish and the bass are only there to maintain their population. There are three varieties of bluegill available in Arkansas, a, the, basically the native northern strain, the copper nose strain that is a southeastern native uh, species that in certain conditions in Arkansas can grow faster than the natives, but they have to be fed well, the habitat has to be right, and they'll probably grow better in southern Arkansas than in northern Arkansas. They're a warm water fish more than the northern bluegills. And then there are hybrid bluegills. Uh, the benefit to the hybrid is they don't reproduce very much at all. They still reproduce, but not as much. So it's a lot easier to keep their population down. So if you're trying to grow trophy bluegills, hybrid bluegills might be the better option of the, of the three. Uh, red ear sunfish, they're not necessarily a forage fish or a sport fish, but they do fill that niche. What's really good about red ear is they eat snails. And the benefit of eating snails is the snail can be an intermediate host for yellow grubs. So if you ever caught a fish that had these yellow, uh, weird looking yellow knobs in their fins, or if you cut them open and they had these weird yellow grubs in their fillets, red ears can help stop that by eating one of the intermediate hosts of that snail. Now your sport fish, your primary sport fish in most pond is going to be the largemouth bass. It's the most popular in most states, uh, if not number two or number three, and it's going to be found in almost all ponds in Arkansas. Uh, depending on what your goals in that pond are, they might be the primary sport fish or they might be merely a population control measure. There are three varieties of largemouth available in Arkansas too. You've got your native northern strain, You've got the Florida strain that's native to Florida, like the copper nose bluegill, under the right situation, the Florida largemouth bass can grow faster and larger than the native northern strain. But in northern parts of Arkansas, they may not grow any faster than your typical northern strain fish. So uh, just keep that in mind, especially in northern Arkansas, it might not benefit you much at all. Now the hybrid largemouth bass, is like the hybrid bluegill, doesn't reproduce as much, doesn't put as much energy into reproduction, so they grow bigger and faster. Uh, so for a trophy pond, that might be the best option of the three. 
There are two options for crappie in Arkansas, the black crappie and the white crappie. Typically the black crappie is superior for ponds because their diet tends to consist more of insects than fish. The white crappie likes to eat minnows and shad, uh, which are usually not as abundant in ponds as insects. So the black crappie tends to be better in that regard. And their reproduction is more consistent. One of the biggest troubles with crappie is inconsistent reproduction. Uh, so the black crappie is a little bit more consistent with that. Typically, to get a black crappie pond to work, you have to have a high abundance of largemouth bass, and you have to be pretty aggressive with your crappie harvest to keep them from getting out of control. Uh, channel catfish are a commonly recommended one. The really good thing about channel catfish is they are very hardy. They can handle all kinds of water characteristics, especially muddy water. So if you have a pond that is just muddy all the time and you can't get any fish to grow in it very well, you can grow big fish out of that, especially if you feed them. Uh, so a really good option for ponds that just aren't producing well with other species. And then hybrid striped bass, they're an underutilized species, but they're a perfectly reasonable option for ponds that have a high abundance of shad. So if you've got a really fertile pond that's got a lot of shad in it, or if you've got a crappie pond that's just gone nuts and you've lost control of them, hybrid striped bass can help get them under control too. Now the trick with hybrids is you have to have fairly hard, uh, fairly high alkalinity water for them to thrive. Uh, but they're certainly a good option if you've got the characteristics appropriate for them. Now, a few fish species we generally want to avoid, not necessarily because they're bad fish, it's just because they're not right for most ponds. And starting off with green sunfish, an absolutely beautiful fish in its own right. But in most ponds, <clears throat> the green sunfish doesn't reproduce nearly as much as a bluegill. It doesn't get as large as a bluegill or a radiator sunfish can. And it's also competing with your largemouth bass for forage because it's got a really big mouth for a sunfish. So generally they're considered undesirable for most ponds, but if you get some, it's not a big deal. They're a really pretty surprise when you have them, but generally keep them out in most situations. Now the bullhead catfish and the common carp, they're not recommended for similar reasons. Both of them, by the way that they feed, create muddy water. They are bottom feeding fish. And when they root around in the mud on the bottom, they kick up mud and keep your pond muddy uh, longer. Uh, another problem with the bullhead catfish is they don't get very large, <laughs> six, eight inches or 10 inches at most. Uh, so you can catch a lot of bullheads and still not have much for fillets. Um, common carp, they're actually a, an extremely popular sport fish in Europe, but they've never caught on in the U.S. and nobody eats them. Uh, so basically they just make your, muddy, their, your water muddy. They occupy uh, nutrients and energy that could be going to sport fish. Try to keep them out the best that you can. And we spoke about gizzard shad. Uh, in the right circumstances, gizzard shad can be really good for trophy bass ponds, but you usually want to keep them out because they can, uh, they can stockpile in sizes too large for your bass to eat. <clears throat> now, three vegetation control options, biological controls. The most common one is grass carp. Uh, they are very effective at controlling certain species of plants. Like we said, you want to make sure that you identify the plant you're dealing with first and make sure that they are compatible with grass carp. The triploids that are now required in Arkansas live about 10 years, and as they get old, they get fat and lazy. So you've got about five or seven year, five to seven years of good control out of your grass cart before they need to be restocked. Tilapia are good filamentous algae control measures if you can get them in the pond at high enough rates, two to 400 or so fingerlings uh, per acre to start off. Uh, they will control vegetation, but like we said, they are cold sensitive. In the mid 50s, they get sluggish. When it gets to 50, they're dead. Uh, so they're really good for trophy bass ponds and you can eat them. They're quite tasty. And then finally, goldfish are an effective control measure for duckweed and water meal, but you got to stock them really heavy, 35 to 65 pounds per acre, and they absolutely will not work in the presence of largemouth bass. Goldfish are slow. They're dumb. They're dumpy. The bass just eat them up, so they will not work in a bass pond, but they're a really good option for really tiny ponds or water gardens. Now, general stocking rates, this is straight out of the MP360 that has been referenced already. It can be downloaded for free from the Extension website by searching MP360. Uh, these stocking rates are conservative. They're very conservative, but they're also backed up by research. They will work. If you stock these ratios, you will have a decent fishing pond. If you want to grow trophy bluegills, if you want to grow trophy bass, if you want to do crappie, you need to call me. <laughs> we'll talk about some different stocking strategies to make those work. But in general, if you stock these uh, largemouth bluegills, raider sunfish, and channel catfish at these rates, it will work. 
in general, we want to see at least a 10 to 1 ratio of bluegills to largemouth bass to get things started in the right way. If you're trying to grow trophy uh, bass, it might be better to go 15 or 20 bluegills to one bass. Uh, it just depends on what your goals are. With the grass carp, a preventative stocking rate is about five per acre. If you've got a really bad infestation of plants that they will eat, it may take 25 per acre or more. With the, the bait fish, your uh, golden shiners or fathead minnows, oh, five to 10, per, 10 pounds per acre or so is a good starting rate. If you're talking to a fish farm or a pond management person, they may recommend up to 20 pounds per acre of those. Again, each pond's different, each management strategy is different, and they have different uh, requirements. If you have a pond that already has fish in it and you're wanting to get advice on corrective stocking to try to fix an out of balance population, really you need to speak with a biologist directly and, and get some catch data. If, uh, if you can do that, they can come up with an idea of what to stock to get things going back in the right direction. Uh, but there are so many variables at play, it's impossible to give you hard fast rules on supplemental stocking into a pond that already has fish in it. Contact information is here. If you have questions, pop them down in the chat. I'll be answering them here as I can. And uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, Scott. And last but not least, we have George, if he hadn't hit uh, Bourbon Street at this point. No, no, no. I haven't left yet. I'm still here. OK. Um, All right, I'll pull it up for you. You go. Uh, this this will be a very uh, brief because we're really up against it and also very, very uh, not as detailed as uh, I would like for a nuisance aquatic plant control because Arkansas has over 300,000 plus ponds and, and, and each one of them will very be very different in terms of how they would be uh, treated. Uh, advance. Uh, the, first ta the first task in any uh, aquatic plant control uh, discussion always comes down to correctly identifying what the plant, because, what the plant is because they're all different in how, in how they respond. Uh, they're typically going to be classified. It's either going to be an algae of some kind, it's free-floating, it's an emergent, or it's a submerged plant. Uh, advance. And that ties in with the NP44, which is the uh, herbicide guide that's put out by extension and updated every year. And I update the aquatic section of it. And as you can see from that, uh, each of these plants is going to ha has seems to have a very different uh, profile. Uh, not there's there's 16 active ingredients that are legal for use in aquatic situations, and there is not one of them that will work in every situation. And that's just the nature of it. So. If you have a plant that you don't know what it is um, and you just start throwing stuff on it, you're wasting money, you're, you're throwing chemicals out that you really may not want to. And it's very important uh, in terms of saving money, uh, getting good results and, and getting the control you want to first off identify what you're dealing with. Advance. And when I always talk about your weed control, I always deal with a toolkit because there's a lot of tools in there and not all of them are gonna work for every plant, but, the, but you wanna try to use as many tools as possible to just get the best results. Uh, these, all fall, these control techniques all fall under four general categories, mechanical, physical, biological, and chemical, and I'll very briefly uh, uh, touch on each of those. And it's not always a good idea to try to use multiple techniques at the same time and, and think about a year long uh, control plan just because, you know, if you have something one year, you're going to get it back the next year, or you're going to be battling something else. So try to use as many tools as possible. Start as early as possible. Mechanical removal suddenly comes down that you're manually removing the, the, the weeds that can work in some situations. It's very difficult in other situations and there's some real problems with it. But uh, for some small situations around a dock or something like that, it's a perfectly valid way to go about it. And it's one tool in the toolkit, toolkit advance. Physical control, basically you're altering the culture techniques uh, of the pond that, that help prevent plants. A uh, winter drawdown is a perfectly valid technique. Uh, uh, Brett mentioned getting that three to one slope in a pond as much for safety. Uh, that's a, you wanna get that pond down to three feet or below 
And a quick slope allows you to do that because at three feet, you can start shading out the bottom. And if you can shade out the bottom, you can really limit a lot of what your stuff grows. Uh, weed rollers are something I've seen up in Michigan. I don't really see them down here. And boat washing is, is important like you wouldn't believe. Uh, I'll, I'll talk, I'll mention giant salvinia later, uh, but most, not most, many plants uh, will inhabit water bodies that they're not designed to be in or they shouldn't be in simply because somebody didn't wash their boat trailer. Advance. Biological, I'm not gonna to touch on those. The main three species we deal with are grass carp, goldfish, and tilapia. There are some insects that some states are able to use, but typically our winters are just too harsh that they can never become established even though they've been tried. Advance. As I said earlier, there's 16 active ingredients. They're basically broken up into whether it's a contact herbicide and a systemic herbicide. Again, all these herbicide active ingredients are listed in the MP44, and I mentioned them in terms of active ingredient because while Rodeo is one glyphosate label, there's probably two dozen others that are legal for use in Arkansas, and they're all a little different, uh, and you can all get them uh, online because they're not restricted use. And so when I, when I talk about control tech, what, what herbicides you may or may not want to use, I'm going to talk about what the active ingredient is, not a brand name for a, a lot of different reasons. Uh, advance, please. Um, contact herbicides in general, where the herbicide hits is where it's going to act. They're often very quick acting. And so contact herbicides imp have implications in terms of you're likely going to need repeat treatments and you might get some oxygen issues if you're using them during the summer under certain conditions. So they have, imp what, if it's a contact herbicide that has implications in, in use patterns. Systemic herbicides, uh, where the herbicide hits, it moves to a different uh, uh, side of action. And a lot of these systemic herbicides will actually create conditions that cause the plant to starve to death. So it takes more time for the plant to die, um, typically with a systemic herbicide. So you don't see the results as quickly. So oftentimes you don't have the oxygen issues, issues that you deal with, but you have to uh, have reasonable expectations that if I'm using a systemic herbicide that I don't see results right away, but I know they're going to work. Uh, in general, all these herbicides require active growth, but systemic herbicides in particular, if the plant is not actively growing, the herbicide is not gonna work. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, take your pick, uh, most of these plants are gonna start growing at 50 degree water temperature, which uh, unlike terrestrial situations might start occurring in March. Um, it's not uncommon that I start getting filamentous algae calls in March. And at that point, you know, that's when you need to start treating is when the plant is actively growing. Next, please. Uh, this is just a little chart. It, it, it just to demonstrate that uh, if you're looking at plants in terms of submerged, emergent, or floating, not every herbicide is gonna have any impact uh, or the same impact on every plant. And some herbicides are not gonna be effective on certain plants. Next, please. Application, uh, oftentimes with aquatic weed application for herbicides, you're dealing with uh, a three-dimensional uh, landscape, unlike your lawn, which is two-dimensional. Foliar applications, you were just treating the foliage. Uh, it, it's easier to somewhat calculate in that you do have that two-dimensional uh, treatment where you can use a percent solution, or you can just do a length times width, figure out your area and use your, your uh, you know, you, how much per chemical per uh, square foot or, or for, per acre. Submerged applications are a little bit different in that if you're using a contact herbicide, oftentimes you want to be able to use something that will get the herbicide down into the water column, which will be two, three feet down. You want to put the herbicide where it's going to be active and you don't want to treat the whole water body. Um, unless you have to do a whole pond treatment for certain herbicides. And at that point, yeah, you need to calculate the water volume. But submerged applications, it's a very three-dimensional thing. And there's ways where you can actually uh, increase your, your uh, uh, concentration where it needs to be. Next slide, please. Uh, I, as a final note, I will mention that Giant Salvinia is now established in Southwest Arkansas. Um, I'm in Louisiana where giant salvinia was recorded in 1998 in a 400-acre patch, and currently it is in every almost every water body in the entire state, 
and it consumes 40% of their equivalent of the DNR uh, control budget. And they're not even, all they're doing is managing to keep some areas open. Giant South Vinny is a plague uh, that has the potential to really be nasty under ideal conditions. This plant can double its biomass in 36 hours. Um, so it's something to be aware of and you definitely need to be concerned about it. And this mostly trans, trans uh, plants buy uh, improperly washed boat trailers and it can stay on a boat trailer alive for three weeks, dried out and then get moved to another water body and become established. So giant salvini is something we need to be aware of. And I'm sure Arkansas Game and Fish has uh, some people are getting nightmares, uh, waking up in night sweats because of this plant. Next, please. Final hints. Uh, correctly ID the plant. Don't wait to treat. Don't be afraid to use winter, early spring when water temperature gets above 50 degrees. And winter time is a time to use things like aquatic dye where you're limiting light penetration to the bottom. So winter time is, is absolutely a time to think about certain control techniques. Uh, I didn't mention it, but many of these herbicides will tank mix well together and you can use multiple modes of action to get enhanced effect. And then please contact me if you need advice. Uh, it's always going to be a process. It's never going to be, uh, you have this pond and this is what you need to do. It's going to be a series of a lot of questions to really drill down to what might be the best uh, situation in order to get you the best results. Um, as a final note, a problem in August was actually a problem in March and April and May. So calling me in August and hoping to get results. Uh, you waited a few months, but I will help you the best I absolutely can. And it's gonna be a while. There are publications available. The MP556 came out last year. Uh, I think I know the author of that, rep, that publication is too big to email you, but you can certainly download it. And it's a good primer, if I say so myself, Scott helped me with it. Uh, it's good primer on, on really understanding what you need to do in order to control your plants. The MP44 recommended chemicals for weed and brush control uh, that comes out every year. There is a section for aquatics in there. Um, it does, I do try to include a section that has actual brand names that you can search on Google or Amazon to get delivered to your house. Um, so it, it, there are publications available and we'll try to help you any way we can. Next slide. And that's guess, pretty much yeah. all I got. <laughs> I hope that was, because that was the last one I had. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you all for that. Um, I know we are at the hour, but we're willing to stick around and take a few questions in the chat. Uh, there's a few that I'd already identified throughout this. Um, we've got a, about an acre pond that has an aerator in it. How important is it to keep two or three cows out of the pond? They would rather not fence it off if they don't need to. I, I answered that. I tried to oh. type on that. And it is, yeah. it, if you add livestock to your pond, you're adding nutrients, you're sh shortening the life of the pond, you're going to be battling weeds. Uh, the water is going to be warmer and less healthy for your cattle. I can't stress highly enough that if you can exclude livestock, you need to exclude livestock for both the health of the cattle and for the health of your pond. I understand there are situations where that might be impossible. Uh, I think I posted what the fact sheet is on, on alternative watering for cattle, uh, FSA. Um, I can't find it right now, but the, if you can exclude them, you should. Yeah, and I put uh, all the panelists' emails in the chat uh, just so people can copy those. Uh, we will, we did record this and we'll push it out to all the participants um, along with contact information and some follow up uh, information because I know we covered a lot tonight. Did we cover the substrate for breeding uh, crappie? Did we, did we get that? Real quick on that uh, livestock question. Okay, go ahead. The publication you're looking for is FSA 3128, Watering Systems for Cattle Ponds. It shows you some designs on how to install or how to build external watering features and reinforcing sections of the pond so that the animals can still get into it without muddying it up as much. So that might be a good compromise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
did that get covered? I, I know that we had a couple of people. Like it came in right about the time that Homan was talking about pea gravel in the ponds for uh, spawning substrate. So I don't know if it got covered, but uh, just a good substrate for crappie. Anybody want that one? I actually, I, I'm going to touch on somebody asked about dyeing their pond. Um, okay. Aquatic dyes can be very effective unless you have vegetation up within three feet of the surface. At that point, the dye is not going to be effective at all. Uh, that's why typically it, you need to have your pond below three feet. And I recommend starting a dye program uh, January, December, February, as early as possible. Um, but there's nothing inherently wrong with adding dye. Um, oftentimes it can be used if you have a muddy pond to turn it blue rather than trying to alter the water chemistry is a much cheaper option. Okay, let's see. What is a good pH for a pond? Six. In general, anything from six to as much as 9.5 is okay. 6.5 to 8.5 or nine is ideal but they can handle a pretty wide range. The, the biggest trouble is the wide fluctuations in a 24 hour period. If it's stable a little bit high or if it's stable a little bit low, it's okay. But, uh, but generally it's the fluctuations that are the problem. Yeah, yeah, it's those big spikes, absolutely. Is it legal to bring fish from a lake to put in a farm pond? Justin, you want that? Sure. Uh, you know, if it's if it's a pond completely on your property, yeah, it's legal. Um, if you, you could be introducing some unknown disease at that point, you know, what if when when you're buying them from a hatchery system or a hatchery, uh, they've typically gone through some disease certification. Uh, so that there is a risk involved in that, but uh, no, if you, as long as you're not violating any uh, regulations as far as how you take the fish, you know, if it's got a legal length limit and all that, then yeah, you can put them in, in your pond on your property. What shoreline plants are good additions to a pond for looks or filtration? There are a handful that you can try. Pickerel weed, blue flag iris, lizard's tail, and arrowhead. And I'll put that in the comments so it's uh, keep track of that. You can also try the fragrant water lilies, the hardy water, water lilies that are often used in water gardens. Make sure that you're not talking about American lotus. Don't put those in there but you can absolutely use hardy lilies. They're the one that have the little floating flowers, all, all the colors of the rainbow of the flowers. You just go to a water garden supply center or go online to a water garden supplier and uh, look at the cultivars they have of the hardy water lilies. And then the pickerel weed, blue flag iris, lizard's tail and arrowhead. I see those commonly recommended for shoreline vegetation, emergent plants right around the bank. They look really nice, they have flowers and they smell nice. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, how large and deep does a pond need to be to support fish? Timmons, you want to jump in? We haven't given you one yet. Um, well, I mean, you can grow fish in an aquarium, so it doesn't really have to be that large. Um, we recommend that you don't create your ponds uh, small impoundments, anything under 50 acres, more than 12 feet deep, um, which would be the biggest recommendation there. But uh, uh, you can su support fish in a quarter acre pond. You just don't want a quarter acre pond that's 30 feet deep because you're going to have issues. Yeah, you definitely wouldn't be on the three to one with that either. Yeah. Um, okay, do fish limits apply to private fisheries? That's a good question. There are, it, it, if you have a, a one of our fishing guidebooks, there are statewide regulations for different 
fish species. So like the statewide limit for largemouth bass is 10 fish. So yes, technically those those statewide limits do apply. However, none of the none of the length limits apply. So there are limits on the number of fish that you can have in your possession, but there aren't limits on th those length limits are all water body specific. Perfect. Thank you, sir. And I put a link to the uh, daily limits, the virtual side of that there as well. Oh, what else have we got? Uh, 24D listed is, is it safe to use as a control for floating vines anytime during the summer? I will take that one too. There are a lot of aquatically labeled 24Ds. Uh, I will circle back to a, a correctly identify what the plant is and see if it's acceptable to 24D. Find it, it, correctly identify the plant first at that point we can use a, a response rating from the NP44 to narrow in what herbicides are gonna be, be effective against it. You just, you just using 2,4-D without knowing that, you're, you're, you're wasting money, yeah. potentially. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions right now. If uh, there, was a, there was a couple turtle questions. Um, yeah. It is possible for pond owners to build turtle traps and and move turtles to uh, you know a nearby location if, if you do have a lot of excess turtles. Um, Those excess they're not turtles aren't actually hurt anything. Yeah, I mean that's what I was going to say. They're not they're not uh, usually going to eat your live fish. Now, if you have fish on a stringer something like that where they're the the fish can't escape the turtles then yeah they do become a problem there but typically they're not a problem okay. if you don't plant vegetation will you eventually get vegetation you'll get something yeah <clears throat> yeah there's a like lot of dormant problem. seeds in that ground so something will spring up and you will be battling it and and but you know that sometimes that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a, you know, what's the difference between uh, pickerel weed and pickerel plant? You know, whether you're trying to grow it or kill it. <laughs> Seems like hey, most ponds, five to ten years after construction, you really won't have much trouble at all. But eventually, something is going to start growing in it. Yeah. <clears throat> JJ, I got a question that was sent privately to me, okay. which was uh, leaking pond fixes rebuild um, it i'm sure scott or george could probably handle that a little better but there are a number of products out there that can be used to fix leaky ponds yes um bent night is one of them but there are a couple other commercially produced products that specifically go after leaky ponds scott you yeah. want that one yeah sodium bentonite is typically the go-to uh, there are granular for versions, there are powdered versions. From what I have gathered from literature and, and pond management forums, folks that have tried to do it, uh, it's very, very hit or miss unless you know exactly where the leak is. If you've identified a, a leak around a, a, a drain pipe or a muskrat hole or you know some kind of critter has dug a hole through a levee, Bentonite will fix it because you can get a high enough concentration of it, a high enough load of it right on that leak. And that bentonite is a, a very expensive clay. Expensive that it gets big. It's also expensive. But uh, it, it basically is a really, really rapidly expanding clay and it works into those cracks. And once it gets crammed in there together and stops moving, it starts <clears throat> to expand kind of like insulation foam. And if you get enough of it in that crack, it will seal, seal the crack. It will seal the leak. The trick is you've got to know exactly where that hole is and you've got to get enough of the product on top of it. And that's the really tricky part. In most cases, uh, especially in Northern Arkansas where leaks are really common, more often than not, it's going to be more likely to be effective if you drain the pond and excavate any sludge or organic stuff that's built up on the bottom of it and do a bentonite blanket on the bottom of it where you actually resurface it you lay a layer of uh, bentonite on it, and then you compact it with a sheep's foot roller to make sure that you've got 
a full blanket of it across the entire pond, that's the most likely strategy to get it to work. Otherwise, it's really a shot in the dark whether or not you'll be able to pack, patch it. The other option for a pond that just won't hold water is, uh, and I don't recommend this, I just know it works, fence it off, stock hogs, mm -hmm. and they eventually their little tiny feet, they will work it in there and you will have a pond that, that holds water, but uh, uh, you're gonna lose that pond for about a year and then you're gonna be dealing with hogs and there might be a lot of other issues involved with that, but that it, it works. Yeah, you, I've heard that for a long time, and it, it is uh, it is something that works. I've seen it work myself. Um, we've got, I, you know, Lori and Matt may have worked this out in the chat, but we have a, a five-acre pond that's now overrun with Canada geese, and uh, they want to know how to solve the problem, but I think Matt's going to go over there during uh, resident goose season, so... But they did ask, do they have the ability to bring in eggs or other things to their pond? A eggs in terms of what? Uh, insects or uh, plant yeah, I'm seeds? Not, I'm not sure what kind of eggs we're talking about. My assumption is fish, fish eggs. eggs. Yeah. Fish yeah. Eggs. Not, it, I guess it's possible, but that's not your biggest problem with Canada geese. It's what comes out the back end. And then you've got a nutrient loaded eutrophic pond that all of a sudden. Uh, and I'm surprised that nowhere in the chat room that uh, hazardous algal blooms have uh, has come up, but that that could be that could be a whole session on itself. Yeah. Right. And there, extension. I, I co-wrote a fact sheet on HABs that uh, I encourage everyone to download as a primer. Yeah, JJ, I had some questions emailed. Yes, ma'am. Go for it. All right, is it ill-advised to stock a single species of game fish, specifically red ear, in a new pond that's about two acres? The trick is having something for them to eat. <clears throat> the, the red ears are typically a molluscivore. They eat snails and invertebrates, so it wouldn't take them too long to exhaust the food source in there. And the red ears don't tend to eat fish feed quite as well as bluegills do. Uh, they might nibble on it, but I don't think that it would, uh, it would keep them sustained. Uh, that's an interesting one. I've not heard of red ear alone. It might be one where you could try red ear and fathead minnows, because fathead minnows are a fairly small critter and uh, should be small enough for the red ears to eat. If there's, if there's nothing else for them to eat, they'll start eating what's available. Uh, but that's not one that I've seen a, a fact sheet or a publication on specifically red ear sunfish alone. Uh, what is the per acre recommendation for ag lime application on a newly constructed pond? In general, it would be best to have a soil sample done first where you send a a representative sample several different coffee cans full from your uh, from your property and dry it in a in a box and then mix it around so you've got all the samples mixed together well and then take that to the county extension office and then they will mail that to the lab in Mariana to check it for uh, pH and that analysis is free all you have to do is get the sample to them and they'll do it for you for free the trick <clears throat> with the uh, soil sample is you want to ask them for the lime requirement for growing alfalfa, which sounds weird. You're asking for a pond recommendation and you're asking for alfalfa information. The, the alfalfa crop excels at a pH of soil that would also result in a really uh, good growing pond or a good productive pond, right about 6.5 pH. Uh, so ask the extension agent to put on the sample the lime requirement for alfalfa or the lime requirement to reach a 6.5 pH. And then they will tell you how many, basically how many tons of lime per acre is necessary to get the soil neutralized and uh, that pond more productive. Typically in ponds that need lime, it's almost always at least two tons per acre. And in some cases it might be four tons per acre and in really acidic water or really acidic soils, it very well may be as much as six tons per acre of ag lime. Uh, but to, to know for sure, a soil sample is the best route 
to get a, a precise idea of how much you need. Then there was uh, one more. Is there anything in particular that they need to know about stocking crappie? Yes, a lot. Uh, the, <laughs> the text will generally say, don't bother trying it in less than 25 acres. And there are some texts that say, don't bother trying it in less than 50 acres of pond. Uh, so the trick with crappie is they have very inconsistent and sometimes prolific reproduction. And nobody knows what the trigger is for when they have a really big spawn or when they don't spawn at all. They might go two or three years without reproducing at all. And then they'll have one year where they make millions of babies all at once and there's not enough food to go around and they stunt themselves. So uh, right now the, the best recommendation I can give for crappie is to stock your pond uh, based on those general stocking rates that we gave, a 10 to 1 ratio of bluegills to bass, about 500 bluegills to about 50 bass to start. Give the, uh, give the pond a full year of the bass being stocked. And just, Justin mentioned it about stocking timing. Let's say we've built a pond in the summer of 2021 and it's filled up this fall. We're ready to stock fish. You stock your bluegills and your forage fish this fall, 2021. And then in the spring of 2020, you would stock your largemouth bass. And I wouldn't recommend stocking crappie until at least 2023 to give them a full year for those bass to grow up and get to a size that they can eat on those crappie and then start uh, stocking your crappie if you are stocking a reproducing black crappie, I would do about 50 or so per acre to start. Uh, not very many because they reproduce quite a bit. Uh, if you're using a hybrid crappie, one that doesn't reproduce as much, try 250 per acre. Uh, really, the extension service is based on giving research-based information on stocking and management. There is no freaking research on stocking rates of crappie in small ponds. So we're kind of shoot, we're, we're taking a shot in the dark on a lot of these stocking rates and management uh, techniques for crappies. But as we learn more, we'll let you know. The hybrid crappie deal is kind of a new thing. We're still figuring out how they work. Uh, but if you can get them, uh, usually they're more available in the fall, I believe. If you can get a hold of them, hybrid crappie are a good option for a crappie pond. Okay, that's all I had in my email. Okay, we've got a few questions about lime. I think George is handling most of them in the chat. Um, yeah, the, the ag lime is crushed limestone, so uh, it won't harm fish. The soil test is, uh, soil test and lime application help you understand how well the pond will hold water or just with pond productivity. Sure. So the, uh, just that one too. No, 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 Scott, go ahead. So the ag lime, it is primarily for neutralizing acidity in soil, not so much uh, holding water. Uh, so it, <clears throat> it would be something that you would apply early on when you're basically you're finishing the basin of the pond uh, before it fills with water. The best time to apply it is right then when you can actually till it into the soil. You get a much better acid neutralization if you can get the lime on the soil and tilled in before the pond fills up. Uh, the next best, if, you're, if your pond is acidic or if it is not productive, it won't make a plankton bloom uh, and we test it and it's got low alkalinity and low hardness. That is when we would recommend applying lime and we always recommend using agricultural lime because it is completely safe to apply on fish. You could dump, uh, you could dump, 10 tons of agricultural lime right on top of a, a fish and it wouldn't kill it. <laughs> it is, it's very safe. It, it actually dissolves fairly slowly. You'll get some of it dissolve right into the water immediately, but most of that limestone, even the finely crushed stuff, it sinks down to the bottom and it starts basically dissolving into the mud as it encounters uh, acid in the mud, it starts breaking down. And it will slowly start to increase the pH the alkalinity and the hardness of your pond. And once you get to about 20 milligrams per liter of alkalinity and hardness, your pond should start naturally producing plankton blooms. And especially if you can really get it up into the 40s and 50 milligrams <laughs> per liter of both, your pond will be very productive and, and able to respond to, to fertilizers and, and should hold as much fish as you are interested in dealing with. 
George mentioned in the comments, uh, hydrated lime is a big no-no in ponds. So, so what you do or what you apply to a pond that has fish in it is agricultural lime and agricultural lime only. Now, if the pond is empty, if uh, there are no fish in it, you can get away with hydrated lime. You can use less of it to get the same effect. But if you put hydrated lime into a pond with fish in it, you're going to kill your fish. So always use agricultural lime if you have fish in the pond. There was a relation where the was talked about the soil test. Uh, the clay content is what you need to know it's just to tell you whether it's going to hold water or not. Oftentimes you can find that out with if you can find the county uh, plat book where they actually did the soil testing that can give you an indication or if you know somebody that will actually test for what the clay content is and, and uh, the NRCS uh, uh, construction guide will give you recommendations on that. Uh, but the, the soil test that that's, gets sent off the extension is that's not going to tell you clay content. Sure. So unfortunately, that's not going to tell you whether it will hold water or not. It's strictly for to to establish uh, that baseline for primary productivity. Sure. And the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the NRCS, George was referring to, they do have a responsibility to help with private to pond owners constructing ponds, but I. I have spoken with county agents and pond owners on a regular basis about trying to contact the NRCS. The NRCS is focused mainly on agricultural stuff. So if your pond is used for livestock watering, if it's used for irrigation, NRCS is, is on the job. They'll come in and check and make sure that the clay is right. They'll make sure that the pond is built right. And there may even be cost share programs to help you build that pond if it's used for agricultural purposes. But if that pond is primarily for aesthetics, or if it's primarily for fishing or recreation, non-agricultural purposes, there are no NRCS funding programs. And frankly, it might be difficult to get a conservationist out to the pond uh, to check on things because their duty is to agricultural livestock kind of stuff. And just like AGFC, just like the extension service, there's only so many of them to go around, so they're busy. Uh, they're busy all the time, and they may not have time to come out to a fishing pond to check it. Let's see. Let's see. Is NRCS the direction I need to take in enlarging uh, or deepening my pond? Currently, 1.5, and no more than four feet deep. I would check with them first. It, uh, the, it depends on the county. Some of them are more willing to come out to private ponds, private fishing ponds for, uh, for inspections and assistance. Uh, but check with the NRCS first. If they won't come out and look at it, at least ask them for their uh, excavator list. Uh, most of the NRCS agents will have a list of contractors, dirt movers that have experience with irrigation or livestock pond repairs or construction. And if you can't get the NRCS guy out, he might at least be able to refer you to a, an excavator that could give you a quote. Thanks, Scott. Um, that seems to be it. Last call. Uh, while we're waiting to see if any other questions pop in, I want to thank everybody for sticking with us. Uh, I know we went an hour and a half and I know time is valuable, but I guess that means that what we we're saying was resonating with people and it's information that they wanted. So I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in tonight and definitely want to thank our panelists for, for coming out. And well, I guess you didn't really have to come out, but you had to tune in there at night, uh, take away from <clears throat> times with uh, friends and family and things like that. So I think that's it. Uh, we'll be doing this next month, same same time, same same schedule. I think we are August tenth, and we'll be talking about the Arkansas Game and Fish Stream Team. So it'll be another uh, exciting and hopefully action packed seminar. So. Once again, thanks everybody, and I appreciate everybody's time.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.